Hey, Bay Harbor family, we're so grateful that you're with us tonight for another 30-minute meal. We're continuing our conversation in Philippians with Spence, and we're so grateful that you are with us. And uh, really, we flipped the page into chapter 2. This is running a lot longer than what we thought it would be originally, but uh, we're just trying to see what it is that the Lord is speaking to us. And it's been so enriching Uh, the nuggets that he has been speaking. And I know tonight is not going to be an exception to that. So without further ado, I do want us to pray, and I want to get straight into the word of the Lord to see what he has for us. So let's pray together, all of us. Father, we thank you for this night, this opportunity that we have to get into your word. And as I'm holding this book in my hands, I am holding truth. And this truth has the power to change lives. And I pray that it would do that tonight. That, Father, as we get into the words that are written, that those words would get into us. And even if it's difficult and challenging for us to hear, that it would come alive to us. Yes. And the same Spirit who ignites a passion in us to hear it would be the same Spirit who would ignite a passion in us to follow it. We praise you and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, knowing this book uh, somewhat, you, you've enlightened us with a lot. 
But this section that we're in right now is one that gets to the depths of, of really what it means for us to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Yes. And yes. so uh, I, gave, I gave a hint to all of us last week when we were together that this is where we're heading. And so this is where I want to start. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Yep. So, all right, give it to us. It seems like we keep doing this every time. Uh-huh. You'll start a little further down in order to answer that question. We'll have to back up just a little okay. bit. Let's do it. So, if you look at verse 3. Yeah. Um, I was trying to skip over that, Spence. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to do it to answer this question. It yeah. says, don't be selfish. Yeah. Don't try to impress others. Yeah. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. So, you can read this. And, That's and, why I was trying to skip it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. This is when we was redoing the floor. This is a scripture that I actually wrote over here. Wow. Um, because I need to remember this. Oh, my goodness. And, and, and you can read this. And I, when I'm studying, I like to read all different versions. And um, I believe it's the uh, English Standard or the New English Version. It says, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. Yep. So what does that look like? So rivalry is when I'm in competition with you, if you have a big house, I gotta have a bigger house. If you have a nice car, I have to have a nicer car. I'm, I'm in competition with you out of rivalry. And conceit means that whenever you win, I get hurt. Mm. I'm a hater yeah. because of you. So we must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. What was his attitude? Nothing that we do can be done out of rivalry or conceit. Jesus was not in rivalry with anybody. He was here from the foundations of the earth. He was here during creation. Yeah. There's no one greater than him. But and, and we'll read this on down a little bit. He didn't think anything about his equality with God, but he robed himself in flesh just so he could come down and experience what we're experiencing and thinking of others greater than he thought of himself. Okay, so since you went ahead and went with three, I guess we're going to have to look at four sure. before we get into five. <laughs> Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Does this also tie into what he's saying in this about the attitude? Absolutely, absolutely. We, we can get tied up in, we talked about this a little bit uh, last week and the week before, in things of this world. What, what, what am I focused on? What am I driven toward? And, and it's our own interest. We all have wants. I mean, he, he told us in his word that he would supply all of our needs, but even past our needs, all of us have wants. And, and, and it's not always what I want that's what's best for me. Yeah. And it's looking for the wants and needs and interest of others even greater than mine. And, and if we follow Jesus' example, we'll find that when we, when we press into that, when we put others even ahead of ourselves, that the reward to that is I'm going to end up with what I really wanted to begin with. It, it, it's, it's the divine flip yes, that God does oftentimes within our life, and, and it's beautiful. Now, I'm noticing in my Bible, and those of you that are watching and you're following along within your Scripture, there's an indentation when it comes to verses 6 through 11. Yes. And, and it's possible that this was an early hymn of the church that was already floating around. But I, you've alluded to it. Actually, you've alluded to it more than once. And so this gets to some meat right here. So let's, let's take a look at that, however you want to go about it, um, and whatever it is that, that God is speaking to you in this passage. So let's just read at four, starting at verse 6, though he was God, this is talking about Jesus, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, and being born as human being, he appeared in human form. He humbled himself, he humbled himself, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to a place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all names. Hmm. Last week, we talked about true virtues of Christianity, and this is one of them. And that's the reason I said it three times. He humbled himself. He humbled yeah. himself. So who does God exalt 
and who does he oppose? God will exalt the humbled every time. We can go over to Luke, the first chapter. Oh, yeah. I feel the Holy Ghost right now, yeah. Pastor. And, yeah. and another song that Mary sung, and, and, and she even talks about in her song how, how he, he evades kings, but he raises up the humble. The rich leave empty, but the poor leave filled. He always exalts the humble, but he opposes those that are exalting and exalt themselves. Mm. So... Hmm. And, and another, another thing to remember, and I try to remember this in my personal life, if, if I will allow God to exalt me in whatever position instead of me pressing in and trying to exalt myself, if I exalt myself, there's but one place to go, and that's down, yeah. to fall. But if God exalts you, whatever God exalts cannot be torn down because it's 100% built by him. And if he exalts you, that's the place to be. So in this passage that we just, let, just read, number, verse number nine says that God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him a name that's above all names, which we know is the name of Jesus Christ. And it's right. the name by which we're all saved. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, this gets so deep. And I, I go back to what you mentioned one time. Uh, several weeks ago, talking about the flesh. You know, there's a struggle inside of us. Absolutely. But by nature or nurture, we will default to the flesh. Yes. And so these are the types of attitudes that's got to be cultivated in us, and this is a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. As, as we started talking about early on in this, even maybe the first week, this Philippians, the book of Philippians, is a beautiful picture of what a maturing Christian and a maturing church should look like. This is not going to happen right out of the gate. Maturing takes time. Yeah. You know, and if you want to get fleshly, biblically, a man wasn't really considered a man until he was 30 years old in biblical times. That's a lot of maturing. Yeah. So it, it take maturing takes time. And this is We've talked about this, you know, with some people at the altar of, of salvation, there's an immediate, just a complete wiping clean of everything, and they get up and they, they don't struggle with addictions anymore, and they don't struggle with attitudes anymore. They, they, but it didn't work that way for me. It was a work in progress, and this is something we can't, we can't be overly uh, aggressive on. It's going to take some time, and we're going to have failures. But the goal is to live as Christ. The goal is to pursue him as much as he pursues me. And I'm going to tell you something. God is pursuing every one of us every day of our life. The Bible tells us that, that um, mercy and grace shall pursue me, shall follow me all the days of my life. That's from the womb to the tomb. Yeah. And that's every man, woman, boy, and child. That's everybody. But if we will pursue him the way he pursues us, these virtues are going to come into effect. You'll see there's going to be a change in your life. I, I, I receive that as a promise. Absolutely. A promise of God and, and really a, a word of prophecy to us that reminds us of the power that Jesus has to change us because this, we must have this attitude. That's going to that's gonna take time. But this is somewhat troubling. I mean, we know in verse 1 that it talked about Paul identifying himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But now we have Jesus, it being said of Jesus, that he, he became a slave. Mm -hmm. So we know that Jesus is God. So God became a slave in human form for us. That's powerful. Humanity itself is slavery. We talked about this a few weeks ago. The Bible tells us we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. That happened in the Garden of Eden. Everybody that's been born since Adam has been born to slave. You're yeah. slave to sin. Yeah. It's your nature. It, you, you can't help it. You have to make a conscious choice and decision to change that. Jesus, although he was a man without sin, never sinned, he still was robed in flesh. Yeah. He's the only human being that has ever lived without sin. Think about that. 
Well, well th- just the thought of him himself. I, I don't know, and I'm very cautious about this, because Jesus is more than just an example for us. Yes, he is. He, he's more than just somebody who comes in and, and, and shows us how we should live our life. It is actually through him that we do live our life. That's right. But he is the example and not a greater act of humility Mm-mm. than for God to come down and to be with us. That's right. And so with that, that becomes our motivation for, for what it is. And, and so I know we could get theological about this because he never ceased to be God when he was no. here. No. But I think it says it right there that he gave up his divine privileges. He laid aside his rights. And, and, and quickly, that's what's required of us sometimes. Yes. Is to give up our rights for, and I, maybe that's where he's going with this, for the, the greater good, the good of the church, the good of the good news. Yes. Yes. So what do you see in that? That's, um, and, and uh, honestly, my feeling on that is when I look at what he's done for me through salvation, I know the change in my life greater than anybody because I live with me every day. Every time I look in the mirror, it's me whom I see. So I know the change that he's made in my life. Therefore, I should want to pursue him. I should want to have that same attitude. I still wrestle. I still fight against my flesh. Um, I, I, have to make, I have to make a conscious decision daily, sometimes numerous times in the course of a day, to hold myself back so that God can shine through. Because at the end of the day, Pastor, where Jesus was our example, he is now living in and through you and I. We are the example that the world is looking at today. We might be, and I know you've heard this said, but we could be the only Bible that some people read. Yeah. And folks know that you're a Christian. They've already drove by and seen your car in the parking lot. You, you can't hide it. Yeah, and I, I guess in this moment right now, it's, it's, it's all hitting me um, of what he's done, but then also my failure is I represent his name. And um, I, I want that. I don't want to try to impress others. I, I want to be humble. I want to think of others as better than myself. We don't think of others that way. No, a lot of times we, we do we, not. We want to, I want you to be, look bad so that I could feel good. And, and so what God is doing in your life, and I don't know if you sense him like we do, but what he's doing in your life through this whole process is all an act of love because he wants, he wants to pull that greatness out of you. And it's painful. Yeah. But if you will continue to follow him, he'll take you to places that you can't even begin to imagine. So, um, you know, I, I guess it just fits right in, Spence, as we go into the next verse. I, I didn't necessarily plan it that way, but this is, this, is, this is what we're looking at. But dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it's even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times when you're in class, in school, it's easy to do what the teacher is doing because they're doing it on the chalkboard. And they're doing it in front of you, and you got a vision, a, a visual of what's happening. But then when you get home on the homework assignment, it's hard to remember exactly what the teacher was doing. Paul's saying right here, he was, he was their teacher. He said, listen, I seen you do it yeah. when I was there. And that is important. That's, that's a learning process. We learn by watching and, and by example of others. But I need you to do it even more when I'm gone, I need you to work really hard on it. And this, this is, this is the, the, the whole climax of what he's saying. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. I am different. I wear the same clothes that I used to wear. 
I look the same as I used yeah. to look, but there yeah. is a difference. I'm working hard to show the results. I want my attitude, my outlook, the everything that's around me, how I approach things, I need that to be different. That's a change that happens in us. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. So let, let's hang our hat right there for just a minute. Okay. Am I scared of God? No. This is not, this is not a, a fear that I am afraid of him. He is a God of love, but yes, he is also a God of judgment. This word fear here is, is connotative of the word awe. I'm in awe of him. So if, if, um, if I were to go into a zoo and, and, and there's a male lion in the cage, and, and it's, he's lived in this cage his whole life. He was raised by, by hands, never, never been in the jungle before mm -hmm. in his life. He's never had to hunt for his own food. He's always been fed by humans. And they gave me an opportunity to go in there and feed that lion. Would I do it? Mm. Probably not. Yeah. It's not necessarily that I'm afraid of him because I see other people in and out, petting him, tussling him, running around with him. He is tame as much as you can tame a wild creature. But I am in awe of his power yes. and the ability that he would have to take my life. It's not that I'm, ooh, I'm scared to death, but I'm in awe yeah. of this creature. Yeah, That's the fear that I should have of Christ. It's I'm in awe of what he has done for me. I'm in awe of the capabilities that he has. If, if he created with just a spoken word everything that we see, as you were talking about Sunday, the size of the universe and, and, and the earth being his footstool and the heavens as his throne, and if that's the God that wrote, I feel the Holy Ghost, that robed himself in flesh and came down here and set an example for me, an example that I should live by, I should, I should obey him with a deep reverence and awe in what he's done. He didn't have to, Pastor. And this is something that, that gets a hold of me. It shakes me to my core every time I think about it. It is a true statement. If I were the only human being on planet Earth that was lost, he would have still done it. Mm. Do you think that somewhere along the way, let me, let me put it this way, what is the danger of us losing that deep reverence and fear? I think that because... God doesn't always act right now. People say, well, if I'm telling a lie, God strike me dead right now. Yeah. And it that. don't happen. Yeah. They better be glad that Dave Spence ain't God because they'd be a bunch of smoking shoe prints laying yeah. on the ground. Because I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. just to show that. But because God doesn't operate that way, people tend to think, well, he ain't going to do nothing to me. Yeah. I'm good right where I'm at. I'm fine. And, you know, the Bible even speaks of us doing things over, over, and over, and over until our conscience becomes, like, seared with a hot iron. Just because, I, I, I heard a little, little joke one time, a guy said, when I first got saved, he said, I couldn't smoke any cigarettes, I couldn't drink no alcohol, I couldn't cuss. He said, but I've grown in grace so much, I can smoke a pack of cigarettes, drink a whole bottle of alcohol, and cuss out my wife, and never feel bad about it. Now, mm. what's, what's the problem here? Because God hasn't gave me instantaneous punishment, I think that he's okay with it when he's not. No. And, and I'm not, I'm not um, drawing closer to him. I'm separating myself from him. Not that he's moving, but I'm moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm losing connection with him. If, if I... If I always judge my closeness to God by my separation from the world, I'm going backwards because the world's getting further and further and further away from God every day. Yeah. So yeah. I need to judge my closeness to God by my closeness to God. Whew. And when we lose this, we miss out on everything that he's about and who he is. Absolutely. And, and I, if you have something to fear, that is one thing to fear. Yep. 
the fear, I, I've heard so many, and you've heard it too, people, I, that my greatest fear is disappointing the Lord. And, uh, and I guess that's why in the King James, and this is not the first time, the only time that Paul talks about work hard to show the results of your salvation. We've already covered the fact that there should be that, that fruit that we bear as a result of the change of character that's in our lives. But, but even in this, um, that's why the King James, and, and I'm sure it was with you, the way that you memorized this was work out your own, own salvation, salvation. Yep. with fear and trembling. Yep. And it doesn't mean that we're working for salvation, nope. but we're working it out once we are saved That's right. because it's a continual part of our lives. Yes. And I think we miss that too. But it, and, it, and it's a daily workout, Pastor. You know, if, if, you, um, hmm. if hmm. you're a runner, <laughs> yeah. I'm not. You run daily. I run if something gets after me. Yeah. So which one of us is going to have the most endurance? It's the person that does it daily, yeah. over and over. It becomes, and, and actually it will come part of your, your process. Yes. It'll, it'll become a habit. Yes. And, and this is a good habit. Because I'm, 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 just like you said, I'm not working for salvation. I'm working to perfect to what he has started in me. I know that he'll perfect it, but he needs some help from me. Yeah. I can't just sit idly by and say, okay, God, you do the work. Yeah, it's not My grandmother happen. used to tell me all the time, God won't do for you what you can do for yourself. Uh, true, true that. And he expects us to be part of the process. Absolutely. And sometimes we miss out on that, which makes verses like this next one uh, 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 a little bit hard to swallow. Do everything without complaining and arguing. If we're jumping in this and we're talking about the attitude of Christ and we're going to be real with ourselves... Yep. As he stands before us, how big is that? That's huge. Whew. And this is so convicting. I, I, I did a thing years ago in, in our Sunday school class where we had little rubber armbands. Yeah, and I, I got that. everybody to, to sign a contract for a 30-day fast. I believe it was 30 days. might have been 45. And, and what you did was a fast on negativity. And any time that you complained or said something negative, you'd have to take the armband off, put it on your other arm, and start over again. I, I cannot tell you, and, and it's me included, how many people had to start over and over and over and over. I, Pastor, honestly, I would, I would really have to look back. I got certificates from everybody that participated. I mean, there's a stack of them. I, if I'm not sadly mistaken, it took me about 90 days to be able to wear that armband on one wrist continuously for, a, I think it was a 30-day period. Now, it took me three months to complete one month because we are so prone to complain or argue about something. But he jumps on this pretty, pretty quickly. He jumps on this out of the gate, and he, he'll go on to talk about living clean and living a, as bright lights in the world, mm -hmm. and he'll, he'll, he'll talk about all of that, but he starts with this. Why do you think it's important for him to start with this idea of us not complaining and, and, and argue? Must, must have been problems in the church, must have had things that were going on within them. We, we, don't, we don't necessarily know that. But is it possible that this is what can stop us dead in our tracks? Absolutely can. Remember, early on in, in, in the first chapter, he's talking about us be, going forward with one mind, one goal, one purpose as one body. So do I argue with myself? Do I complain to myself about what I'm doing? No. No. When I get in an argument, it's going to be with you. Yeah. If, if I'm going to complain, I'm going to complain about you. I'm not. So if we're all in one purpose, one mind, one body, one goal, with one, one set destination, what really what is there to argue about? Yeah. yeah. Your dad put it the most beautiful way I've ever heard it put. Four things we can agree on. The virgin birth the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what that means to me, if we can agree on that, everything else will work itself out. Yeah, well, I, I, I believe that. Me too. And, and so it, it becomes real 
with us there. And he, he goes on and he says, the reason I don't want this is so that no one can criticize you because we are the examples and people are watching us. Yep. This does not mean that we're unhappy about things. It doesn't mean that we, don't, that we always agree with everything. I guess it's really speaking to our response to those times. Yes, and, and, and we've experienced this right here in, in our, our local assembly. Um, there's change. There's change that's going on. As long as the message of the gospel doesn't change, the way it's delivered can be changed. Music, we've talked about this numerous times. Mm -hmm. um, my generation, the older generation versus the newer generation and the way that music has changed. Man, the first time I heard Burning Bush over in the, in the youth building, I was like, dear God, what are they playing over there? It's what's reaching, the, the message is what's relevant. And how do we reach the world? A lot of people can still be saved through amazing grace and, and, and that, that type singing. And I'm not against it, but I'm also for, and I'm not the easiest guy for change. I'm kind of old myself. I'm getting on up there, but change. And we have to embrace when, it, when the message hasn't changed. We got to cling to the message. But the way that we deliver the message, how can I reach this world today? How can I reach this generation today with the same gospel that reached me? Yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned worship wars coming out the gate as an example because that is where the enemy often comes in within congregations and change is difficult. But I, I, as we finish out tonight, our time is already up. Wow. What he really gets to is going back to the attitude of Jesus, going back to us thinking the way that we should think about and then going back to the idea of unity in the church. Yep. And so really not sure tonight what you're taking away. I don't know what it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you as we get to the truths of his word. But it is powerful. Just the one verse that you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Let me ask you, how's that working out for you? How do you see yourself? What areas of improvement do you think that you need to make as you continue in this journey with him? I don't know about you, and Spence, I'm not sure for you, but for me, it's very convicting. Yes, it is. And uh, I don't know that I want to wear a rubber band for 90 days uh, or 30 days to get to that point, um, but when you begin to put that in a practical application, it becomes real. And so continue in him. Make sure that as you're working out, so to speak, your own salvation, that you're doing so with, with fear and trembling. And that was to the body of Christ. Yep. And so thank you. Any last thoughts before we go? Time is already up. I just, I just want to hit verse 13 uh, real quickly. It says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what's pleasing to him. Father, thank you yes. that you are working in us in this moment. And tonight as we're hearing these words, they're striking deep inside of our heart. But We pray that this word would come alive to us, yes. that you would continue to work inside of us, yes. that you'll continue to give us the desire that we have to serve you, to do what pleases you, and that you would give us the power to do what pleases you. May our lives be characterized by servanthood. And Father, that doesn't mean that we serve you and everything is going well. Father, that means that people are going to talk about us, people are going to misunderstand us, we're not going to get any praise, we're not going to get any attention. All these things are going to happen. But I pray that you would be in the forefront of every single one of our minds yes. and that we would walk out the fullness of what you have and we would shine brightly for you in a world that is dark and in need of the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. Yes. We proclaim this in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Bay Harbor, for being with us on this 30-minute meal. Looking forward to seeing you in-house at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. this Sunday morning or online at 9 a.m. God bless you.